Good evening. My name is Asher Beeman, and I come here from the University of Virginia. I'd like to welcome you tonight to the third evening panel for our spring school figures of authority, people, texts, traditions. I'd also like to welcome our guests um, who are joining us over Zoom, and a special welcome to our colleagues from overseas who spent more time than they bargained for on airplanes and airports arriving here only late last night or this morning. A special thanks to our collaborating institutions, the Catholic Academy in Berlin and its Intellectual Diaspora Initiative, the Fest in Heidelberg, and the University of Virginia with its Virginia Center for the Study of Religion and the Forum of Democracy, and finally with its Jewish Studies program. This third evening marks about the midpoint in our workshop. And if we were actors in a classical Greek drama, we would be approaching slowly the peripeteia, the turning point. Of course, we don't know yet how this drama will end, whether it's going to be a tragedy or a comedy, <laughs> but we do know that, or something in between, but we do know that its subject, the subject of authority, makes for plenty of suspense. Indeed, we began our discussions with the power of the authoritarian and its counterforce of the anti-authoritarian. We continued with a discussion on authority and the authoritarian as challenging and qualifying what we perceive as liberalism. And we turned today, this morning, to questions of charisma and tradition. And perhaps that is indeed a turning point of some sort because we are moving from figures of authority to configurations, to a figura of authority. We're moving away from the charisma of individuals to the charisma of traditions, from the authoritarian to the authoritative. This move, it can be argued, was already exemplified in Moses Mendelssohn's 1783 book, Jerusalem, or on religious power. And it's a very timely note because right now you're going to have an exhibit on Moses Mendelssohn at the Jewish Museum here in Berlin. In this book, we encounter two types of authority. The authority of the state, which extends over our actions as actions and can or must therefore also be coercive. And the authority of the church or religion which extends over our actions only insofar as they lead to convictions or to moral beliefs, and which therefore cannot coerce, but can only instruct. While well, the first authority then has the right and power to exclude, the latter must be, by definition, an inclusive authority. Exclusion in religion argues Mendelssohn, would be tantamount to excluding a sick patient from a hospital. The strength of religious power in, Ju in Judaism lies for Mendelssohn in the fact that in its current, that is, diasporic form, it does not invest authority in individuals, but in tradition alone. Halakha, the law, is the figure of Jewish authority. And inasmuch as its teachers can only admonish and instruct, their authority does not have the power to become authoritarian. What many Christian and Jewish critics <coughs> considered the tyranny of Jewish law represented for Mendelssohn the authoritative but not authoritarian character of what he called the living script. Now, some 30 years ago, I sat with the late David Flusser. David Flusser was one of the major scholars of, um, of early Christianity, Bible, Hebrew Bible, in his kitchen in Jerusalem. 
We discussed Jewish philosophy, we discussed Franz Rosenzweig, Hermann Cohen, and Martin Buber, whom we didn't like very much. And at one point, Flusser said, you know, Judaism has much more in common with Catholicism than with Protestantism. But what about the Pope? I objected. <laughs> Flusser shrugged and says, and we have got a chief rabbi. <laughs> to this I have to say that if you live in Israel, the, uh, the chief rabbinate in Jerusalem has a, a lovely name by secular Israelis. It's called the Datikan. Dat is the Hebrew word for faith, uh, which shows you how Israelis perceive the rabbinate. Now, we are very pleased this, this evening to have with us a scholar who has written eloquently about the authority of popes and the Catholic tradition and it was focused also on the role of Jesuits in the process of globalization. And this is Professor Jose Casanova, who has asked me to make it short, very short, very short which is not easy to do. Um, so I'll say a few things. First of all, as he sits here, he is a professor emeritus um, from Georgetown University, also a senior fellow, fellow at the Berkeley Center. Um, he served also as the Kluge Chair in 2017 at the John W. Kluge Center, where he worked, spent the better part of his time working on a book um, on the Jesuits and globalization, historical legacies, and contemporary challenges. His classic book that most of you probably know and have in your libraries um, is entitled uh, Public Religions in the Modern World, which appeared with the University of Chicago Press in 1994. Um, and this is a book that interrogates different theories of secularization and uses case studies really in Poland, in Brazil, Spain, and the United States. Now, Professor Casanova um, studied, and this is, I, I didn't know this until recently, he actually studied also at the University of Innsbruck uh, in Austria, so in that sense we are Landsmänner, um, and then continued his studies in New York at the um, New School for Social Research, where he uh, received a degree in sociology and also still heard, as I learned last night, Hannah Arendt. Um, among his many, many other books, and then I will make it very short, um, just let me mention a few more, um, together with Michael Walzer, uh, Das Europa der Religionen, 1994, and with Hans Joas, who joins us here tonight, um, an edited book called Religion, uh, Religion und die Umstrittene uh, Moderne. Um, in addition to the book on the role of Jesuits in globalization, um, he also edited um, recently a book, Islam, Gender, and Democracy in Comparative Perspective, um, which appeared um, in 2017 with Oxford, um, and is now working um, very intensively, actually, on the Ukraine. And this is something you may not know about Professor Casanova. He's also fluent in Ukrainian. Um, also in German, of course, in many, many other languages, um, but most impressive in Ukrainian. And he's actually poised to move, to go to Ukraine with a delegation um, in two days um, from now. And this is um, much of his recent years, really, his role as a public intellectual um, and activist um, of religion. Now, we have two respondents um, who will speak to you, Professor Casanova's lecture. And I'll begin here by introducing you to Riyud Paz, um, who is an Israeli scholar um, working on international law and European law and international relations and legal history. Uh, she studied at the University of Helsinki um, and received her PhD from Barilan University in Israel. She's the recipient of many, many fellowships, um, including the DRID fellowship, and she also um, spent two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation um, here in Berlin, um, as well as uh, the Free University and the University of Wisconsin Law School. Um, among her many publications, uh, let me point you to one, um, to one of her books, which appeared in 2012. Um, it's called A Gateway uh, Between um, 
Now I have to take my glasses off because I cannot read this. <laughs> Between a distant God and the cruel world, this is too small to print here, um, the contribution of Jewish German-speaking scholars uh, to international law, which appeared with um, Brill. Finally, uh, we have here with us um, Professor Christian Polke, um, who received his PhD um, in Heidelberg in 2008, um, was habilitated in Hamburg in 2015, served as the Ernst Cassirer Fellow at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Studies in Uppsala, and um, since 2016 um, is Chair or Professor of Systematic Theology and Ethics at the Georg August University in Göttingen. He too is the author of many publications and books, including Public Religion in Democracy, a study in the Religious Neutrality of State, which appeared in 2009, Expressive Theism, Reconsidering the Question of a Personal God in 2020, and he is the co-editor of Religion and Politics, Main Works in the History of Ideas, which appeared in 2017. I'd like to invite now um, Professor Casanova to proceed with his lecture, and then we have Riut and uh, Christian respond briefly to the lecture, and we'll open it to discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Biermann. Um, thank you, the, all the organizers, institutions, and individuals for the pleasure of being here. It has been two years. It's very nice to be back in Berlin after two years of COVID separation. And it's very good uh, to be back at the Catholic Academy, where I've been a few times, always memorable occasions. So um, the title of my presentation is Sources of Papal Authority in Our Global Secular Age. In today's presentation, I'm going first to sketch briefly the traditional centuries-old internal sources of authority of the papacy within Catholicism as a historical religious regime. In the second half of my presentation, I'm going to focus on two new external sources of authority visible primarily among non-Catholic publics, which have emerged in the second half of the 20th century and are clearly connected with novel dynamics of our global secular age. Within his analysis of the triadic typology of legitimate types of authority, or actually domination, let's not forget that Herrschaft is different than authority, Parsons translated it, but uh, many of the questions we have here, when we think of types of domination, then we are talking of regimes of domination, of enforcement, of all kinds of things, which do not appear in our discussions of authority. But in his uh, typology, Max Weber used the papacy as a paradigmatic illustration of the process of routinization of charisma into institutionalized charisma, a form of traditionalization, so from charisma to traditional institutional authority, and particularly is the canonical prototype of the charisma of office, which could later be transformed into the prototype of legal, rational, bureaucratic authority. In this respect, the papacy historically as a form of authority spans and bridges the entire spectrum of the three main types of legitimate forms of domination, traditional, charismatic, and legal rational. With respect to Weber's theory, the main point I would like to make in my presentation is that the contemporary sources of papal authority point to a blind spot in Weber's theory. If one superposes the tripartite typology, you know, traditional and charisma are two forms of personal authority, ordinary, extraordinary, then legal rational is the ordinary impersonal form of authority, and then there is an empty spot there. If you look at the four-part types of action, uh, habitual, traditional, 
charismatic affective, the two, and then down Zweck, a rational or instrumentally rational, and then Wert rational or value rational. So somehow, the value rational aspect, what we discussed yesterday as normativity, is not really in uh, uh, Weber's theory. But I think that precisely the two sources of authority I'm going to look into point to the need to go beyond Weberian typology. Uh, I'm on purpose using ambiguously, again, I already displaced the dual connotation of authority and uh, domination. Inasmuch as the papacy had the institutional power to enforce its claims to authority within the Catholic Church as a religious regime, then one can rightly talk of a form of papal domination. Whenever these claims are not institutionally enforceable, then one can talk of authority. In any case, all claims of authority are relational and imply an uncertain relationship between the claims of the authority that demands obedience and the response of the subjects who are the addressees or recipients of such demands. All forms of authority are in this respect interactional and solicit diverse kinds of more or less obedient responses from the diverse levels of participation within any kind of regime, from the inner administrative staff to the most remote outsiders. And let's not forget that for Weber, the key relationship was that between the ruler and the staff. The subjects really don't pay so much. So what differentiates the authority is not so much that between the rulers and the subjects. It could be similar in those three types. Is that between the rulers and the administrative staff that enforce the rule. There is no room within my brief presentation to examine the many titles used or appropriated by the papacy through the ages in order to illustrate its changing claims of authority within the Catholic Church as well as within the medieval system of Christendom. Let's enumerate a few of them. Bishop of Rome, as primus inter pares within the Episcopal Magisterium of the Ecclesia, of the Church. Patriarch of Rome, or Patriarch of the West, of Occident, as primus inter pares among the five ancient patriarchs, the other four being of the East, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople. Peter's successor, the rock upon which the church is built, who holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven, still the keys are there in the papal uh, 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 flag, and thus possesses the patrine privilege to bind and unbind in earth as in heaven. Pontifes Maximus, supreme pontiff and highest priest within the sacred sacramental institution of the church. Vicar of Christ on earth, your holiness, your sanctity as honorific titles. Prince of the church, a sovereign ruler of the papal estates. Holy father of all the Catholic faithful. All these many titles point to the unique dual role of the papacy as sacramental mediation between the transcendent city of God and the immanent city of man and between a spiritual religious and temporal secular powers within the socio-religious system of medieval Christendom. Now, the dissolution of medieval Christendom connected with the Protestant Reformation and with the formation of the Westphalian system of sovereign states not only put an end to the authority of the papacy in Protestant countries, but most important, it curtailed drastically the role and authority of the Pope within the emerging Westphalian international system of states, which claim absolute sovereignty, denying to the papacy its supranational role of legitimation and mediation between temporal powers. The negative connotation with the words popis and popery acquired in public discourse in Protestant countries for centuries can serve as clear illustration of the loss of papal authority and prestige. The reaffirmation of papal supremacy and the declaration of the dogma of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council, 1869-70, points simultaneously to the high point of the claim of papal authority within the church, within the religious regime of Catholicism, and to its lowest point in terms of papal authority 
and prestige outside of the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, from this very low point throughout the 20th century, one can observe the reemergence of an increasingly important role of the papacy within the now globalized international system of states and simultaneously the increasing prestige of the figure of the Pope beyond the ranks of the Catholic faithful as a spokesperson for global humanity. It should be evident that the sources of this newly found authority and prestige transcend not only the authority of the Pope within the Catholic religious regime, but also the three Bavarian types of authority or domination. The newly, acquired points of the newly acquired authority points to sources that seem to emerge from the very process of globalization and to a form of authority which appears to be related with the Bavarian concept of impersonal value rationality rather than with the concept of impersonal instrumental rationality or legal, legal rational authority. It also cannot be related to the concept of personal traditional authority, nor to that of personal charismatic authority, although some of the recent popes, Jan XXIII, Jean Paul II, Francis, have undeniably displayed some personal charisma. In my view, it is the important role of the office of the papacy itself not the personal charisma of its holders and, the, no, and of the norms that this office propagates publicly that I would like to emphasize. The two roles, increasing, or the two sources. First, increasing role of the papacy within the global international system of states. Besides its power to consecrate rulers and thus to confer or withdraw legitimacy, the medieval papacy also played the historical function of an international court of arbitration and appeal, guarantor of international conflicts, and peacemaker. Indeed, canon law and papal rulings serve as the solely recognized authority in medieval international relations. At the Congress of Westphalia in 1648, both European and Catholic princes agreed not only to exclude the papacy from being a party to the treaty, but also to disregard all papal protest to the treaties of Münster, Osnabrück, and Westphalia. This concerted effort of secular rulers successfully shut out the papacy from European international affairs until the 20th century. Benedict XV was the first modern pope to become engaged in international affairs again. Elected shortly after the outbreak of World War I, he became an eloquent, perhaps the most eloquent, spokesperson for peace in all of Europe. Even though Benedict XV's exhortation fell on deaf ears on both sides of, both Catholics were on both sides of the, of the what he calls the suicide of civilized Europe, with this making Europe into a, uh, basically, a charnel house. But his interventions, although they fell on deaf ears, uh, formed the basis for the growth of international prestige and, ironically, diplomatic recognition of the papacy in the 20th century. In 1878, after the unification of Italy, the dissolution of the papal states when the Pope was a prisoner in the Vatican, the number of countries that recognized had diplomatic relations with the papacy, it was not yet the Vatican, Vatican City, were four. Four countries only in the entire world had diplomatic relations with the papacy or recognized the papacy. It increased to 14 in 1914 at the very eve of World War I. By 22, the year that Benedict XV died, it had increased to 25. It was 38 by 1939 on the eve of World War II, and it reached 70 by 1973. 20 years later, following the collapse of the Soviet system, the number had doubled. In 1993, the number had doubled to 144. 
And today the number is 183. Basically, every country in the world has diplomatic relations with the Vatican, with the exception, two significant exceptions, uh, China and Saudi Arabia, which have diplomatic uh, contacts and communications. Actually, they, wrote, they had a concordat, China and the Holy See, but have no formal diplomatic relations. The other few, other four or five countries are small islands, small states that cannot afford to have diplomatic relations or a house in, in Rome. The reason for the growing diplomatic relevance of the Vatican is clearly not that the Vatican City is such a powerful sovereign state. The centrality of the papacy in the new global system was recognized by the Soviets when Nikita Khrushchev welcomed Jan the 23rd's mediation during the Cuban Missile Crisis. When the superpowers and the entire world saw themselves at the brink of nuclear war, a higher principle of mediation had to be fine, found. The security of humanity and of the planet had to have precedence over national and state security. The Vatican has been careful ever since to cultivate an image of mediation above the superpowers. Indeed, it claims to represent the interests of the international system as a whole. Since Benedict XV's enthusiastic support for the League of Nations, he and Wilson were the two main voices for the League of Nations, the popes have been consistent advocates of worldwide international bodies from the World Court to the United Nations, which would limit or should limit absolutist state sovereignty, arbitrate international disputes, and represent the interests of the entire family of nations. So this is the first source. The second comes in the name Defensor Ominis and first citizen of an emerging global civil society. The papacy has also assumed eagerly the vacant role, they've appropriated it because nobody else took it, the vacant role of a spokesperson for humanity, for the sacred dignity of the human person, for a more fair division of labor and power in the world system, and lately for a just ecological and sustainable development. The role comes naturally to the papacy since it is fully in accordance with its traditional claims of universal authority. In a sense, the papacy has been trying to recreate the universalist system of medieval Christendom, but now on a truly global scale. Yet, the fundamental difference is that the spiritual sword can no longer seek the protection of the temporal sword to buttress its authority vis-a-vis -vis competing religious regimes. The official recognition of the principle of religious freedom as an inalienable human right means that the Church has accepted the challenge to compete in a relatively open global system of religions. Simultaneously, the popes have actually been promoting, perhaps more clearly than anybody else, interreligious and intercultural dialogue as the most adequate way of addressing common global challenges and to work jointly for what they call the global common good. The popes have traditionally carried the honorific title of Holy Father of all the Catholic faithful, but now are increasingly adopting the role of common father of all God's children and of self-appointed spokesman of global humanity. Jean Paul II was probably the first one to use the self-designation of Defensor Ominis, a new title for the pope. The popes have always claimed to speak urbi et orbi to the city of Rome and to the globe. But this has become a reality only in the last 60 years through numerous papal encyclicals, which beginning with Pachen in Terris in 1963 are no longer directed mainly or exclusively to the Catholic faithful, but rather to the entire world and to all people. The figure of the papacy anticipates and points to the need for a type of global governance, oriented towards what this pope calls a globalization of fraternity beyond the world capitalist system and the international system of states. The question I would like to raise today is a speculative question is whether our system of global governance, I'm not saying government, but governance, 
met I need perhaps the strengthening of a global civil society based on the principles of equality and diversity of cultures, moralities, and religions, which are precisely manifested in the emerging global system of religions, which I have designated as global denominationalism, but not only religious communities, also there are many secular global uh, denominations, feminist, pacifist, ecologist, etc. The function of such a global civil society will be not to supersede, but rather to complement the present system of global governance. It is the transnational and transcontinental character of so many religious communities and their aspirations to address global humanity that give religions their special role within global civil society and the potential to contribute to a globalization of fraternity. Socio sociologically, we know that this has been the main contribution of religion throughout history, namely to generate and regenerate structures of solidarity within any social order, but also to facilitate prophetically process of fraternization beyond kinship and beyond cities, beyond tribe, beyond kingdoms, and even beyond empires. Thus, the dual function of religion in ordinary times to serve the traditional function of social integration through legitimation of the established order, and in times of crisis and transition to serve the charismatic prophetic function of critique and of envisioning new, more just, and solidaristic social orders. The dominant theories of secular modernity had assumed that both were roles which religious may have played in the past, but that due to process of fundamental or functional differentiation of the secular spheres, religions were becoming irrelevant for the functioning of the modern world, particularly for international relations, for the global, precisely, governance. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11, governments, international organizations, social scientists and journalists began to take religion seriously again, but mostly for the wrong reasons, out of fear and anxiety over the power of the sacred to disrupt secular structures of global, global governance. But the focus of our attention, I want to argue, should be redirected to considering the potential role of transnational religious institutions and communities in helping us all rethink and reform our structures of social governance. Indeed, the global response, or lack of response, to the COVID-19 pandemic has made evident the dysfunctional character of our global system of governance and its inability to respond in a globally responsible and solidaristic manner to the global public health crisis. This comes on top of its inability to offer credible responses to the growing global environmental crisis, to the growing global challenge of immigration and refugees, and to the global challenge of increasing inequality between and within nations around the world. To this, we can add the inability to respond to a serious international crisis when the presiding member of the Security Council of the United Nations is the one that breaks all the rules and then uh, uh, still uses nuclear blackmail. He very clearly, the global system is not able to respond in a meaningful way to, to this challenge. So those are global challenges, all of those which demand global responses, which I say neither the world capitalist system nor the world system of nation states seem able in their own to provide a meaningful response to any of these challenges. In his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Francis expressed this idea in a stark prophetic terms, number paragraph seven. For all of our hyperconnectivity, we witness a fragmentation that made it more difficult to resolve problems that affect us all. Anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we were already doing or to refine existing, existing systems and regulations is 
denying reality. I repeat, anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we were already doing or to refine existing systems and regulations is denying reality. Religion needs to be, religions need to be taken seriously, not for the wrong reasons, out of fear of the damage they can inflict on our modern secular systems of governance. Notwithstanding the dysfunctional character of many of our religious institutions, manifested most clearly in the ongoing sexual abuse scandal within the Catholic Church, as well as in the entrenched clericalism and male patriarchy, which is so widespread throughout all religious institutions, religions ought to be taken seriously if and when, following Pope Francis, they can contribute to a new culture of the encounter and to strengthening bonds of human solidarity beyond borders. It is an open question whether religions could possibly play such a role. What is clear in any case is that we need to think about the empty quadrant in Weber's typology of legitimate authority, namely a type of impersonal, not personal, but impersonal authority for extraordinary historical transformations, which corresponds to a type of creative action that leads to the institutionalization of normative values. And I'm very glad to have Hans Joas here with us, which perhaps has dedicated his life work to precisely think through these issues. From the creativity of action, to the genesis of values, to the sacralization of the person, to a positive genealogy of human rights, to the power of the sacred, to under the spell of freedom. It is the search for this creative normativity that perhaps can bring something new into the world. So thank you very much for your... Thank you very much, uh, Professor Casanova. Um, it's beautiful to listen to you. And, uh, and I know With that- my accent? That's you. <laughs> But I have one too, you see, it must be not as good as yours though. Um, and, and, and I know that also what you, what, you, what you speak about is really something you live. And um, so it comes truly, if you will, from, from the heart. And um, to, look, to listen to how you describe the transformation of the papacy um, from kind of figurative personal authority to a symbolic authority of the figure of the, of the Pope. Um, and to that kind of charismatic authority of the office that then begins to serve, um, if, I, if I hear you right, almost like a, like a global moral conscience. Um, so I'm wondering how our respondents might develop that theme a little bit, um, also historically and from the perspective of your own of thinking about law, the national law. And I'm going to invite now to the podium, uh, Ud Paz. All right, okay. So thank you so much for this. Uh, many thanks, Asha, for this kind of introduction. And uh, many thanks, Professor Casanova, for a very fascinating paper. I uh, learned a lot. Um, let me just say that I honestly do not know how I got here. So, uh, well, I do know that a few months ago, uh, while having lunch with Stefan, he mentioned that you were coming to town, uh, Professor Casanova, and I did mention how I relied on your work uh, on, on, for a paper on secularization, uh, religion, and international law that I was working on. Um, and voila, here I am. So, you know, this has just accidentally happened. Uh, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, but that I'm supposed, I of all people, I'm supposed to give a comment on uh, sources of uh, papal authority in our global secular world. Well, that, that is interesting as such. So yeah, thanks. Um, as you heard now, I'm, I'm really not a theologian or a philosopher, but um, a rather a legal historian who focuses on international law and uh, Jewish thinkers. So in my few 
uh, minutes of fame, I will just mention uh, a couple of things that relate to the convoluted history of public international law and Christianity that remains the disciplines Achilles heel, um, aka international law is hardly as unchristian, uh, secular, or indeed pluralistic as it wishes to be. Uh, Tematizing Jewish scholarship in the discipline certainly proves uh, that much over and over again, so I'm happy about that. So if I followed your argument closely enough, you argue that Weber's work on charisma and Herrschaft um, is not only still relevant, but perhaps even more relevant today, even if uh, Weber's triadic uh, typology uh, missed the inclusion of a fourth alternative, uh, which is a function of impersonal authority for extraordinary historical transformation, which, which corresponds to the type of creative action that leads to the institu institutionalization of normative values. This you see as the external source of authority that the Pope is asked to perform more and more uh, since the first Vatican Council in um, 1869 to 1870 which was the lowest point of the external appreciation of the Catholic Church, by, but the highest point internally. This low point, you argue, marks the beginning of an uphill movement, so to speak, that takes uh, shape in, during the 20th century. Now, I wonder if this narrative is precise. That is to say, sure, the papacy may have assumed a more eager role as the defender of humanity during the second part of the 20th century, but not really throughout the whole century. Or more precisely, we should ask how successful it was in defending humanity in the 20th century, and this is a question that needs to remain very open. As you mentioned, Pope Francis in his uh, Fratelli Tutti admits um, there is still an unfeasible fragmentation in spite of our hyperconnectivity, even in the 21st century. But more importantly, I wonder if we should want the papacy to actually act as a more significant mediator uh, in our dysfunctional and indeed fragmented world. Furthermore, we can expect the papacy to do so without, can we expect, sorry, can we expect the papacy to do so without the inherent missionary bias that by definition is a part of Catholicism and Christianity and hence also international law. In order to make the connection between both Christianity and international law clearer, we can indeed go back to the peace of Westphalia that, as I mentioned, I'm very happy you mentioned. So, uh, although I personally follow Marty Koskinemi's approach that argues that international law is a project that starts with the foundation of many international legal organizations set up mostly by Protestants uh, during the last three decades of the 19th century, which is not entirely disconnected from the ex cathedra proclaimed by the First Vatican, uh, that you also mention, but the more traditional take is, as you probably all know, uh, that Westphalia uh, remains the accepted birth moment uh, of modern international law uh, because it modified the political map of Europe and influenced the present structure and configuration of the discipline. As you say, this Congress excluded the papacy from being a party to the treaty which con uh, concentrated a, a concerted effort of secular rulers successfully uh, shut out the papacy from European international affairs until the 20th century. But again, just how precise or successful uh, this was in promoting inter-religious and intercultural dialogue adequately should remain an open question. After all, the Peace of Westphalia remains primarily an intra Christian denominational struggle, uh, struggle that resulted in a new compact of religious tolerance for Christians only. And this needs to be underlined. The treaty that restructured Europe's pol politics of religion lacks any reference to Judaism. Although both Catholics and Protestants relied on the Jews and their money to finance the, uh, the, uh, the, the Thirty Years' War and peace. Again, the Westphalian right to free exercise of religion neglected the Jews and hence, was, uh, and hence was also of just a rule of expediency. It was less an expression of religious tolerance than a pragmatic acceptance of that social stability had a price, a price that the Jews paid in their omission during the Peace of Westphalia, and again, that such a blatant and aggressive religious submission is tied to a cornerstone in the, historical, in the historical narratives of both European Christianity and international law cannot be overlooked. 
Neither should we ignore how this was augmented in the repetition of such religious antagonism against European but Jewish other later in Europe's second 30-year war from 1914 until 1945. Ergo, the earlier met metaphorical exclusion turns into the real physical elimination that encroaches on the absent present condition of the Jewish people in their European Christian environment. Ultimately, the silence is still a reminder of the bimillennial Christian anxiety of Jewish influence. And here, obviously, I have in mind Harold Bloom's anxiety of indebtedness and that self-appropriation involves. So whereas the complexities of this condition exceeds the purpose of my somewhat provocative comment, it is interesting that the Jews are missing from your narrative here today as well. Hmm? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you did. No, made us entirely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Although you seem to be critical to, to the agreement with Mussolini in 1929, there is absolutely no engagement with the Pope's role from 1939 until 1945. This, this, I'm, I'm sure. This is such, uh, makes me feel very uncomfortable, particularly when your dialogue, um, when you di diagnose an external desire for more papal authority with other secular international bodies. Uh, such as the UN and the world courts, be it you know the ICC or the ICJ today. Um, there is, as you also mentioned, uh, so much to be done internally by the papacy, right? Uh, be it the ongoing sexual abuse scandal, the male patriarchy, or then the contemporary ecological and sustainable uh, development that you mentioned. This was indeed unpacked in Pope Francis' uh, 2015 Laudio C, Laudio to C, sorry. Uh, these internal, albeit global, issues of uh, the Catholic Church from within are so important and complex, especially, for instance, when we think of global commons and we keep in mind that the Church is one of the largest, if not the largest, non-governmental landowners in the world. Thus, if only to be a bit provocative, I do wonder if the Pope or Papacy or indeed any other cosmopolitan, international and more secular, because I don't really believe that exists, um, body can truly serve as the spokesman, or sp uh, that was a Freudian slip, but as a spokesperson of humanity as a whole. And uh, I, I don't think we disagree on this, uh, and obviously the Pope admits too that um, not only is global fragmentation here to stay, fragmentation may not be the worst um, a thing. It, it, it's not worse uh, than a single unified global social order that may always fall into the hands of a very uh, wrong authoritarian leader, however impersonal, external driven, or charismatic she may be. So I would just really like to thank you and um, for, you know, for the time to be a bit provocative. <laughs> uh, Riot, for your important intervention here. Um, I'm going to ask Professor uh, Casanova to, to still hold on with the response <laughs> <laughs> and um, invite uh, Christian Polke to the podium. Well, okay, thank you. Being part of the conference, uh, this is not a critique of your paper. Uh, I like it. And I just try to think along with Jose a little bit around our conference theme in general. The problem of religious authority is as old as historical religions are. So I'm speaking as a Protestant theologian and ethicist. The problem of authority for Christianity is at least as old as Christianity itself. Already in the second century of our age, that is, or time, is the formative phase, the early church had to struggle with movements who seemingly share the same traditions, textual resources, ritual practices, and so on, but with different meanings and interpretations. However, already in this period of time, three basic components had crystallized to create a common ground of what is Christian and what is not, namely the Bible as textual resource for any Christian community, then the so-called regula fide, a kind of elementary creed based on the faith of the apostles as true interpretation of the gospel, and thirdly, the institution and office of the bishop as the institutional framework within the church 
is organized as distinct community besides family, the city, the political community, kinship, the local and imperial authorities. In German, one speaks of the three Bs, Bishop, Bishof, Bibel, Bekenntnis, whereas in English it is better to know if you say Bible, Bishop, Creed, because that's BBC. One could also say here we already have the tripartite of people, Bishop, text, Bible, and tradition, Creed. These three components formed an institutional as well as a cultural framework and network of what can be called authority in the Latin sense of auctoritas in the Christian tradition. Here, meaning and power goes always hand in hand, shaping a normative universe which must be filled with social life. But it was and still is not always clear that this meaning is an ultimate one which transcends human self-interests and that this power is a spiritual one that refutes to use violence. However, there is no important mention of the role of Pope at all, at least until the late third century. So far, the Bishop of Rome acted only as a kind of spiritus rector, a kind of primus inter pares as the successor of the apostles Peter and Paul. And it is no incident that it was during this period, during the period when the Roman Empire got into main political crisis, that the Bishop of Rome became more and more influential, also politically. The rest of the story is known. Now, in his paper, Jose gives us an illuminative analysis of a sociologically and historically well-informed interpretation of papacy. Using Max Weber's three main types of legitimate forms of domination or authority, though I know that Jose prefers the term domination as the correct translation of the German word Herrschaft, and combining them with Weber's ideal types of action, he argues, that there is a main lack in Weber which impedes an appropriate understanding of the role of the Pope of papacy in our present time. Quote, the missing quadrant would be the one corresponding to value rational forms of legitimate authority, Jose says. This is for him obviously the case if you focus on the role of the papacy from the end of 19th century until our own days. In the process of an ongoing globalization, it is not so much the charismatic form of authority and domination that characterizes the role of popes, though there have been several popes which used their charismatic personality in shaping the pontificate. Just think of John XXIII, John Paul II, or Pope Francis. Then it is the role of the pope of an official defensor hominis, a self-proclaimed advocate of human rights and the safety of the planet that characterize best the modern form of papacy when you link it to external sources. Thus one can say there is a modern version of the three components I mentioned above. The idea of human rights does function as a moral regular fide, which finds its Christian roots still in the Bible, in the idea of man as created in the image of God as his beloved child, and in humanity as one human family living seen as a parable for the kingdom of God. And finally, there is still the Bishop of Rome, the Episcopal, here the papal authority, not so much as mere church leader, but as a representative of a still non-institutionalized global society, which is extended through the times right up to the future generations, or the first citizen of a global society, to put it more metaphorically. I do not have to repeat the examples of history of the 20th century Jose has given for his argumentation, but I do have some questions or remarks regarding his main thesis about papacy, and in this respect to this paradigmatic case of religio-political authority, and I restrict myself to three comments on this. First, I agree with Jose that religions have a dual function the trend in the transformation processes of our times, strengthening structures of solidarity and the prophetic critique of structures of domination that contradict human dignity and the future of the planet. In this respect, the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy can be active advocates of a spiritually embedded, namely Christian moral universalism, not alone, but as important examples, not the only one, so to say. However, even transnational 
religious communities need to be relocated in the particular context, and these contexts are still bound, for example, to nation state structures or other more local political systems embedded in different cultures and social class systems. What we currently see in the debates, not only within Roman Catholicism, is a kind of exemplary confrontation between rather globally or cosmopolitically and rather regionally cultural bond of thinking, actors, politicians, civil and religious activists, bishops, as well as lay people. This concerns not only religious issues, but as importantly positions on main political challenges of our time, climate change, human rights, and so on, migration, the role of the nation and religion in it, and so forth. Centralization and decentralization of power, domination and authority, not seen as simple alternatives, but as a simultaneous task, seems to be the, one of the most crucial challenges, not only in politics, but also for religious communities, especially when they understand themselves and trying to act as transnational agents. I wonder if José would plead for the decentralization of domination and simultaneously for a centralization of spiritual leadership in the name of legitimate impersonal authority within the creative process of normative transformation towards a global civil society. Secondly, global challenges like the COVID crisis, the climate change, the war in the Ukraine require global responses. So far, so good, one could say. But don't we experience in the meantime that the only functioning institutions for governance for dealing with these challenges substantially, though not always successfully, unfortunately, are still nation states or similar political orders. That's a question of social governance. Even though I agree with José that we are in need of strengthening existing and of creating more functioning global institutions regarding these questions, I am still skeptical on an operational level. So this is, I'm now talking as a political ethicist, so to say. What kind of political, not just moral or religious institutions should these be that can exercise political authority and social governance at the global scale while maintaining, for example, democratic structures and moral universalism? Furthermore, the tension between globalism or cosmopolitanism and regionalism, internationalism and more nation-centered positions correlate I think, with irreducible tensions between moralistic, universalistic claims and particular moral obligations. And these tensions, again, find their further analogy in the Catholic and other Christian churches between conservatives and progressives when it comes to the same political issues, but also to gender equality or to the secular rule of law. I think that's a point uh, Riot had made. In Germany, we are in the midst of the so-called synodal way, the synodaler Weg, not only but because of the loss of authority of the Catholic Church due to the numerous cases of sexual abuse. However one may judge the cause so far, the rifts between conservatives and progressive Catholics, between priests, bishops, and lay, lay people are deep. I'm speaking as a Protestant sympathetic observer. And it is also clear, I think, that a simple solution, a way out, for example, through more democratization, would tend to deepen these rifts again, I would say. What we are in need of are new ideas and structures, how to balance these tensions between moral universalism and particular ties, between guardians of tradition and innovators with an affinity for the present, between a cosmopolitan and a more national solidarity and subsidiarity. Papal authority, which see itself as a global advocate for the common good of mankind, must locate itself between these poles. Above all, it must take care to sharpen its religious core as the proprium of its action. Only then will it live up to the claim of the gospel, which relativizes all earthly bonds in the favor of the beloved community that transcends all and includes all spaces and times. The papacy, too, has to endure the balancing act between the stabilizing solidarity and the prophetic criticism again and again. And this is also true for the inner church life. 
Let me just add a third point, which I only annotate. Many religious traditions struggle today with the erosion, or to be more precise, the diffusion of traditional and legal authority bound to offices caused by the social media and their new discourses, with some revivals, of course, of charismatic leadership. Even the most hierarchically institutionalized form of Christianity, and that is Catholicism, has to face these challenges. Of course, radical changes in the infrastructure of mass media communication does not automatically lead to substantial transformations in what the purpose and the tasks, say, of the Christian churches and their officials is. But these structural transformations, modes, or, but with these structural transformations, modes of authority do change. And maybe the same is true for the ideas of what is a religious authority good for and all about. In that sense, it seems as if the question of early Christianity, of the early church in the late Roman Empire, appear in a new guise. In the end, in that sense, I completely agree with José and, if I may say this as a kind of a child of Luther, Pope Francis with Pope Francis in two respects. Our witness as Christians must prove itself in a culture of encounter between all people of goodwill. Maybe that is another form of legitimate authority in the old sense of auctoritas. But, and that's my second point, global challenges demand global responses, as Jose says, which neither the world capitalist system nor the world system of nation states seems able to provide on their own. There must be something more. And this more is based on a quality of authority of its own, exousia, as the evangelists in the New Testament would say, but it also needs its own forms of authority that stands up for it. And as a sometimes envious Protestant, I would like to say that who, if not the Roman Catholic Church, with this unique office of papacy, has a better starting condition here to fill this gap? It, took, it should take the chance, provided it remains true to its spiritual claim. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, now, Professor Kazanov, we have two challenges. One challenge that goes more into the historical um, realm, um, one challenge that's more forward-looking. What does it mean to think about global human rights? It's a question that, of course, Hannah Arendt would ask already in 1948. What does it mean to think of human rights if there's no complete political structure to enforce them? Um, so we invite you now <laughs> to respond to these two challenges. And in the meantime, we invite you in the audience uh, to think of questions. You don't have to be confrontational. It's OK if you ask a nice <laughs> question. But if you want to be confrontational, it's also fine. Well, my easy answer is I fully agree with everything you said, both of you. And I've written basically the points you've made in other writings. And the Westphalian system, precisely, it is the Leviathan. The Leviathan is cuius regio eius religio, which means the sovereign decides the religion of the subjects. I don't care which religion, but it has to be uniformity. And for me, Westphalia begins in 1492 with the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain. This is the first confessionalization, the first Catholic state that demands that all the subjects be Catholic. And thereafter, every absolute Eastern Europe demands that all the subjects be either Protestant or Catholic. Right. So Protestant North, Catholic South, and three societies in between, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland, that could not eliminate ethno-religious cleansing half of the population and had to deal with some kind of agreement. Either lender, cantons, every canton is either Protestant or Catholic. Switzerland is by confession, but every canton is one or the other. <clears throat> the pillars in Holland. And of course, this was a time when all the Jews ended up in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth mm -hmm. because it had, the rulers were Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, and therefore the subjects could also be plural. Mm -hmm. So the Jews came there, and the Unitarian brethren, and the Moravian brethren, and the Cossacks, I mean the, the Muslims. It was the model of religious pluralism, the Polish Commonwealth, until in the 20th century, as you said, 
it became the bloody lands, right? It became the bloody lands, where the new form of confessionalization, not through religion, but through the oh, nation, yes. state, yeah. through nationalism. And of course, for Jews, was bad whether you are treated as a bad religion or as a bad nation, but basically the argument is the or same. Or as a race. Well, well exactly. <laughs> so basically the argument is the same. Yeah. So in this respect, I completely agree with you. Also with the fact that the defensor of Mines is something which can only be taken seriously after they have basically taken the discourse of human rights, of course. How can you say you're a defensor of Mines when you tell the Nazi regime, please, to treat the converted Jews not as Jews but as Christians, right? Well, there is no defense of the yeah, human person there, it's only defense of Christians, not of the human person. So I, I have no disagreement with you whatsoever on this. Um, and again, I want to make clear that this is not, I'm not trying to supersede in the system of nation states. But my point was very clear. I, I happened to be in Ukraine when the COVID started and I was in Prague when they closed the country. I gave the last lecture in Charles University and I saw the knee reaction, the knee reflexive reaction even within the Schengen Europe to close the borders. Yeah. Yeah. This was the response, to yeah. close the borders. And that's I understand the, also the, the, the need to do it, but you cannot do it unilaterally. It's Lufthansa simply close the borders, stop flying. So I was a stung, I was a stung, you know, basically in Prague, I cannot <laughs> fly. I was able to fly out of, out of uh, Prague through Istanbul, Turkish Airlines back to the States the night when Trump also closed the borders in, <laughs> in America. My point is that uh, nation states are there for national security reasons. And this national security can address global issues. Yeah, they do it internationally, but we need a different type of, in this, and my argument is, in the same way the international scheme of states, <clears throat> had to have some kind of, uh, um, I mean, we know what happened. I mean, there was a constant warfare, nation against nation in Europe. So, and we, and we could enter again a new period of, uh, uh, I mean, if we don't solve this crisis now, in a way, which I'm afraid we are going back to a, a bipolar war of the democratic wars against the rest, which will be the most terrible result out of this, out of this crisis. So, I mean, I fully disagree with, with you in terms of what you've said, and I, I've written on it. And the same for you, the three issues that you raise. I mean, I wanted to point out, I don't talk about the Catholic Church as a religious regime in this paper. I've written on it in other places, and I, I'm a critic of the Catholic Church within is, I guess, from within, as much as uh, I'm trying to prophet. present, as I said, the external sources. Now, this doesn't mean political authority. Mm. The same way that in my public religious argument, I made it has to be civil society. I'm arguing, again, for civil society and no privileges. And the argument is not that the, the Pope is. That the, no, they've appropriated the role because nobody is taking it. But there should be many others doing it. I mean, and the point is, if we look at the authority, what makes the new... Uh, encyclicals interesting is every encyclical before quoted the previous popes as the source of their authority. Now, that O.C. is the first encyclical, which basically uses as authority the Patriarch of Constantinople, somebody from a different religion, and then uses the arguments of all the conference of bishops from Oceania, from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, precisely where they have uh, felt the ecological problem much more seriously. So it's not because I'm the Pope. I'm learning from the peripheries here. And then, if you look at Fratelli Tutti, uh, the, uh, the authority is with the Sunni Imam from Al-Azhar. And at the end, they, they come up with precisely the kind of the prayer. So you have the one is linked to the Christian ecumenism, and then, of course, on September 11 last year, the three, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Constantinople, and the Archbishop of Canterbury published together for the first time an encyclical on ecological issues. So I'm not saying that the Pope has any privileged role to play. I'm saying that they have only assumed this role because nobody else takes it. So it's not that they own the role. No, but, but maybe there are only a few candidates who can fulfill but right in, now yeah, you but the thing is they, are, they are doing it by linking themselves. I mean, an interreligious... Look, in our age of polarization where we, secular people, secular mm. citizens, cannot talk to one another, you have here these stupendous images of the Pope going to 
uh, the Middle East, talking with the Iman, of going to with the others. So for us, it is the religions that are unable to live together. Today, actually, the religions show a much more openness to interreligious dialogue than we secular people are. So let's, let's face it. So this distinction of secular religions is problematic for me when you are put in those terms. Mm. Law, sure. Secular mm. law, sure. But, uh, so anyhow, this, I think that... Mm. The, the, I just want to add that uh, what I find fascinating in, in Israel, the, the status quo, which comes from the Ottoman time uh, of Jerusalem, is the only um, of, um, international legal uh, uh, aspect that actually works on the ground, and it's not Christian. So the beauty here <laughs> is that it comes the, from the, 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 the yeah exactly right. the so millet, so maybe the we, system right yeah so maybe we need you know more uh, inter inter interfaith dialogue to start with that would then I mean, for <laughs> me what makes the new global system of religions as opposed to the capitalist system one single system based on an equal exchange between centers and peripheries and the global system of international states, which is based on, it's a plural, but not pluralistic, is homo basically isomorphic units, some of them more powerful, but isomorphic units, the religious system is based on the principle each religion is unique and different and has the right to be different. And this is, of course, what the Jewish people have been saying since ever. We don't want to be part of this universalist project. We want to be ourselves. Yes, but this is what the religious system today each religion claims to be unique and different and yet not unequal. So this is, I mean, I learned this message in a slogan of a temple in Sao Paulo uh, of the Umbanda, Afro-Brazilian religion. We are different but not unequal. Women say that. So we have a first question from, from the audience. Um, Teresa, please. With these final comments that you have made, Jose, um, I was going to, to touch upon this point because I think that Pope Francis very clearly, this figure, whatever authority might claim in the world, it's been very clearly in this going into dialogue. And you have said it now with the Sunni and with the Shia, and then quoting the people in the encyclicals and with the rabbi in Rome, and he had already done that in Buenos Aires. So it seems to me that instead pretending or trying to fulfill the role, even if to fill an empty space, right? He very clearly has declined that, <laughs> very clearly, and maybe paradoxically, maybe not so, because of that, he is, I think, a reference for many, and, and surprisingly so, in the midst of the crisis of pederasty and all this, but very clearly on his part. And I think he's attempting not to do that only uh, to the outside of the Catholic Church, but he's pretending to do that within, which makes him more strong and coherent, right? Thinking this decentralization of the church and this involvement of the local conferences, giving to the local conferences, even the possibility that has been talked, it's not the case yet, that uh, in Brazil it was about to be the possibility of ordaining married uh, priests as priests, and this has not happened yet, but it might happen. It's now a possibility in the horizon, right? So it's interesting for me to speak about authority and not to think of a centralizing figure. But it's an authority that ends up existing in symbolic ways and very effective, maybe, precisely because it uh, declines that. And on that final point, that like the Jews have been saying, because we are in this conference with, with no dialogue between Christian and, and Judaism, that the Jews have always been trying to be left to be themselves, right? And now we all have learned the lesson. I'm not so sure about that, <laughs> whether we have learned it or whether if it, that's exactly what, what to, to, to respect that claim means. Because I'm thinking now of Daniel Boyarin, for example, that he would very clearly say, that's how we can move together is because let the Jews be Jews and say, you cannot convert if you are not born. And, but not try to make Christianity look like Judaism either, that they don't need it either, right? So let Christianity pretend this universality, but then enter in dialogue with somebody that says, hey, I'm out. And what happens when this is acknowledged, but not because we try to make the Jews like the Christians, but also not make the Christians like the Jews. So I think that's part of the challenge that we have. And if I may, I mean, internally within the church, I mean, the more encyclical which was for internal is, of course, Evangelii Gaudium, right? And there the ecclesiology which appears is that 
of a community of communities. The parish is not a centralized priest or it's a community of communities. And the local church, the regional, is a community of communities. And up to Rome, is a community of communities. So the model, but of course, uh, it's very hard for him to uh, say, well, I am not going to tell people. The argument he makes is each local church, other than the gospel, which is what we cannot give up, everything else is basically negotiable. And negotiable means that local churches could have radically different structures. Which, of course, is the, what the Jesuits learned when they brought the Chinese rites and the, and the Malabar rites. If <laughs> Hebrew Christianity could become Latin and Greek in two radically different forms, it could become Japanese and Chinese. This is the argument which the Jesuits made. Of course, it was defeated not only by the Vatican, it was defeated by the Sorbonne, by European universalism. How can you accommodate Christian universalism to Chinese culture, to Hindu culture? So it was as much universalism of the Enlightenment. It was the Sorbonne that as much rejected the, the, the Chinese rights as, as the Vatican. So this is... Uh, we'll take our next question. Our... Thank you. Now, next question from the audience. Menachem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is, is it working? Yeah. Thank you so much for... Um, for this wonderful discussion. And um, I'm trying to reflect on what, what I hear and, and what I would feel I take from the discussion. And, and there are two points, because really we've been accumulating an ongoing discussion. And the, the evenings have been highlights of, 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 of I think, a, a, a joint learning process. And one point, um, the, one point will lead to the other. First point is, I think, I want to warn uh, us of the seduction of charisma. Yeah. Um, not, uh, Weber is, 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 not, um, is not validating charisma as an epistemic or a moral claim. He's doing a typology, okay? And we very easily in our discussion, I felt a couple of times um, uh, used Weber as a canopy for making strong claims. And I would warn against that. And that leads to the second point, which I take to be, as in my world they would say, the big chidush, the big the novelty of, of, of what, I, what I hear is actually a distinction between universalism and seeing our globe. These are two very different mm -hmm. things. And, and here, I would agree with Professor Casanova that Jose, one of the Jose, things Jose. I've seen um, for over the past 15 years, of almost going yearly to Rome, is, is that for most of us, the notion of a globe or a global humanity is really a complete abstraction. The Catholic Church is the only institution I know, except for maybe the World Health Organization, that is really involved in the question of a global population. Doesn't mean that it touches upon all the people on the globe, but, uh, but there's no other organization that I know, certainly not a congregation, that, that is assuming responsibility for hundreds of millions of people. Um, this is staggering, and I think there's been a great wisdom um, in trying to ask, how is this to be done? How can it be done? Um, what kind of tools do we have to do something like this? I don't think we have, but, I, but this is the point where I, I think that this is um, uh, 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 something that, that, that I would go along with you, that, that serious thought has been given to this question. Is it perfect? No, we're not perfect. We're human, but uh, I think, but um, but I think that that the very ability to distinguish between universalism and and global authority, I think, is is a crucial epistemic and moral uh, um, uh, move to be made. Not only that, I would say that we have to talk of universalism in plural. That we have to learn to talk of universalism in plural. Universalism is a claim, never a reality. Therefore, there are competing what universalisms we, in the what globe. We, what we share, and, and listen, I think, here I can speak as a Jew. What we share is, what we share is, 
share universally is that we're all particulars. Right, exactly. And th so, that's this, and, and but that's this not the same. Again, Sorry. Of universalism is to think that we're not particulars. Well, what the global globalization has, on the one hand, the particularization of the universal and the universalization of the particular. The particular no. This is what globalization implies. <laughs> Our next question will be Chuck Matthews. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful presentation and really great responses. I very much appreciate it. I have um, three questions, and they're simply put. The first is about race. The second is about secularism, sexuality, and gender. And the third is about capitalism. The, about first, capitalism. Capitalism. the first question, it seems to me that part of the moral strength of the way the, the church has been heard universally is precisely because it has been up until very recently, a centrally Euro-American institution. As the Roman Catholic Church um, demographically changes and becomes far more um, an African and Asian church rather than a Latin American and Euro-American church, um, how is that going to alter or challenge this church? That's the first, first question. Second one, are there other institutions, and I think this gets to both the responses, that the church has to mediate with? Uh, the WHO is a fascinating one, but the UN hasn't come up at all, and that's really interesting. Yeah. How can there be a set of, if not so much, um, uh, if not a kind of uh, a, a, a vernacular that everyone shares universally, um, maybe could there be pidgin languages or pidgin semi-languages of this sort? Um, and then third, uh, the one dimension of this that I don't think got addressed in the talk at all, and, and I, I support the talk, I want this to be true, is this larger question of, of the other institutions. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Paz said that uh, you know, the, the church uh, may be the largest non-government landowner in the world. That's certainly not true. Um, the best estimates, I, on my phone anyway, um, <laughs> that suggest that the Vatican has around 10 to $30 billion of operative capital. Yeah. The Mormons, we think, have around $100 billion in investments. <laughs> but Apple has a $2.7 trillion market cap. Yeah. Saudi Aramco has $2 trillion. Yes. Facebook only has $600 billion, but Facebook reaches 3 billion people at least once a month. Any, any church would love those numbers. <laughs> um, and think about that. So like, given the fact that we have these other institutions which are also hosted by the nation state and interested in making it bend to their wishes, um, how do we help the church and other in moral institutions think about how to confront those um, potentially false, false friends? Can I just uh, oh, start with your last point? Um, I mentioned you're completely right, and I think the real evil lies within your last comment. Yeah, I, I, we, I'm in agreement with you. I mentioned the church because it has land, and when, you, when the cyclica dealt with ecological tragedies of the world, it's the one institution that actually could physically do something because it has land. And somehow I didn't feel that that encyclica yeah, even unpacks it. Oh, no, no, no. So, so that, that was my... Uh, to precisely where the... I mean, he's very clear about the ecological crisis. The worst situation is precisely in the peripheries. This is where... And basically it's oriented to this. This is not where the church has land whatsoever. It's... Uh, uh, it goes back to the first question about the global church being a, a white European church. It was actually Benedict XV that had the encyclical maximum elude to basically begin ordaining bishops in Africa, in Asia, and stop being a colonial church. So it was Benedict XV that did it, because, of course, uh, missionaries in China began telling him, you know, that we have to change the, the idea. So this is first. And it is because of that that then in Vatican II, Vatican II was what it was, not because it was a European council, but perhaps it was a global. It was the first truly global meeting of humanity. For the first time for three years, even Asian bishops had no idea who they were. If you look at the Conference of Bishops of Asia, which basically is at most 5% of the population of Asia is Catholic. Other than the Philippines, they are insignificant minorities. And yet, it's the only, conf it's the only religion that takes a pan-Asian position on all kinds of issues. The slogan of the Asian Conference of Bishops is dialogue with the peoples of Asia, particularly with the most poor, dialogue with the religions of Asia and dialogue with the cultures of Asia. This is the evangelization task, not to evangelize, but dialogue with the peoples, with the cultures, and with, and with the religions of Asia. Uh, it was a majority non-Western bishops. 
The majority by far, I suppose to Vatican I, which was only European with a few uh, uh, Americans and maybe five Latin Americans. It was a, a church of the South. And that's what the documents that came. The last document, which of, of course began basically as a project for Jewish-Christian dialogue, Nostra Etate, ended up recognizing Nostra Etate is a, our age is an age of religious pluralism, not only Jewish Christian, religious pluralism, and it's Islam and all the others. And since then, I don't think, so from the extra ecclesia nulla salus, the church has become today the leading institution in interreligious dialogue anywhere in the world. And this is a fact. <laughs> I mean, look at what the Pope is doing. So this is an issue. The second one, the second one was an I mean, gender is really, really the fundamental issue. The fundamental question internally within the church is clericalism, it's a male patriarchy, which is still there. And, and until very recently, gender, I mean, the whole thing from Boitila to, uh, so the 20 years before, uh, gender ideology. Basically, the argument was gender, the very concept of gender is ideological. And so they bought it from, the, from basically from the evangelicals in the United States, and then they passed the concept to, to the Moscow Patriarchate. And only thanks to, thanks to Bergoglio, today we don't have an alliance of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and the evangelicals on gender issues and traditional family values. Had it not been for this pope, today we would be all in very bad shape in the culture wars in the, in, in the world, much worse than we are today. And um, the third, and capitalism, well, I don't think nobody has spoken as eloquently, prophetically on capitalism as this Pope, I think, uh, that capitalism, the economy kills and so on. And he has recognized that the issue is not exploitation of labor. It's not a mark, it's discardment. Modern capitalist system doesn't need half of the human population to reproduce itself. This is the problem. Capitalism doesn't need. We thought that capitalism could help because eventually it needs universal labor and therefore somehow universal labor will transform the system. Today, and this is the experience of this pop in Latin America, in Africa, half of the population of the world is not needed by the system. And so when you have this, this is the problem. If we are going, capitalism cannot solve this issue because it doesn't need labor anymore to reproduce itself to make profit. Your question was whether there are other institutions on a global scale, the churches or other religious communities should well, Islam, relate, Islam should, and this should relate issue, to. Islam yeah. and this issue is the other crucial potential. But the problem is that uh, within Islam there is a lot of... I, mean, I think the, the Shiite message, the Shiite more than the Sunni on these issues, but of course, uh, we are, I mean, here we have to enter into the fundamental issue of how other religious, let's say, come to this, to this issue. But there is a lot of similarities. There is a liberation theology today, basically, in every religious uh, community. You have the black liberation theology, feminist liberation theology, Asian liberation theology, African liberation theology. So there is a sense in which this uh, seed that was planted in Latin America has now become localized or glocalized everywhere in its own way. No, 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 I just wanted to, well, you, you asked this question, and I, I was wondering, I mean, if you, uh, Jose said the market system and also the system of political order is too weak, or, or that's no, not, not uh, oh, sorry, that's challenges. not, that's not enough, yeah, for fostering kind of plural, moral, a plurality of moral universalisms, which is something else than, I think, talking about a global a one global society, I, I'm, I'm still wondering what is that? I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I know what the globe is. And I agree that when it comes to climate change questions, we can talk about a kind of planetary ethos or ethos for the globe. But the globe is an abstract thing. And we, I mean, my idea is more get these, I think, like Jose's, get these moral universalisms into contact, get connected, overlapping, and a dialogue in which everybody can learn from each other. So that's a kind of, I think, speaking, speaking as a theologian, a kind of proper purpose of religious communities today. That, that's not the central point, I think, for Apple 
or all these other institutions. So uh, they have other tasks, but they can help. I mean, this is a question my colleagues in the practical theology, in the religion, media, mass media, and consumer culture uh, panels at the AAR are discussing how to deal with that. But the more interesting thing is, where is the power? Is the power, for example, at the United Nations? No. No. No, no. no. no we, can, we can see the problems. It should be maybe, but it is... It is not, or maybe not. So that's kind of another discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, and but the, look, sen look, and the, the sense is yeah. also which kind of power is successful in, in, in which way. So in that sense, uh, your question is much more tr tricky than it seems to. And I think it's also there are different models or answers in different regions of the world. It's mm. something completely different. If you ask this question in Today's China, under Xi Ping, than it was, let's say, two leaders before. That was the first time I visited China. And it's a, another thing, say, or in the parts of Western or South Africa or mm. Eastern part of Africa. Let's, so. Thank you, yes. Let's take another question. We are almost out of time. So, Kathleen, please, you, thank you. ask a question. Professor Casanova, thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for your big ideas. I, there is an issue that I think has been stated several times, but I'd like to restate it maybe more simply. And in Weberian terms, there's no question that the Pope has power, that the Church has power. And there's no question that power is everywhere. You know, Foucault said this quite simply as well. It's just a matter of how is it functioning. So let's grant that the Pope has power. Um, let's take the next step with Weber. The issue is the legitimacy, you know, the reception of his voice, yeah. right? So, so does he have authority is the question. And so I ask you with this big, this big idea that he would speak for the world, what's the basis of his legitimacy? Hmm. Where would he find his audience and who would listen? And, and if, if you were if he were to come up and he would meet with his people, as we like to say, for people who want to be spokespeople, they'd make a list of five issues and they'd probably look a lot like what Chuck just read there. Those were three of them right there. Where's his legitimacy on those issues? And how would he, how would he make it out of the room, given the target that's on his back on all those issues? What would he say? How can, how can he be a spokesman under these conditions when his legitimacy is under so much challenge? Can you answer that problem for him before you send him out there? Yes. No, I, I wouldn't use the word legitimate. As I said, it's a vacant role that they've tried to occupy and nobody else has taken it. But of course, it means that every time they speak, people only accept it if they like what they hear. So it's a normative, normative argument that only on the basis of acceptance by others, mostly by non-Catholics or by some Catholics, but a lot of Catholics precisely do not listen to the Pope anymore because they don't like this type of... They rather would like to have a different Pope. But he so, has to believe in his legitimacy. What would you tell him his legitimacy is when he's faced with that doubt? No, here we will have to get to the question of authority and what does mean legitimacy. I, I don't use the word legitimate. Here is a, it's a Bavarian concept, which I don't want to use. As I said, if I would have talking of types of legitimate domination, I wouldn't have presented this paper. The, the Pope today has only legitimate domination within the clerical structure of the church, in canon law, but not even with Catholics. Had no, no, no legitimate domination. It doesn't have even the power of excommunication today <laughs> doesn't mean anything. So Catholics don't listen to the Pope. So it's, it's not exactly, it's not that he has legitimate authority on these issues. Basically, it's a question of he's propagating, that was done when they were propagating faith. Now they are propagating universal norms. Now, who wants to listen? Who wants to take it? See, my point is the missing, the missing quadrant in Weber is basically democracy. Constituent powers, not constituted powers, but constituent powers, which actually in Weber, when he discusses the medieval revolutions, the city appears as non legitimate domination. The point is that democracy is not only a system of bureaucratic administrative legal rule, but also one which is based on normative principles. And if you don't take these normative principles seriously, there is no democracy. So, and my question is precisely 
He's, they are propagating universal norms. Not universal power, not universal authority, universal norms. Whether anybody wants to listen or not and take it seriously. But the fact is that we know that even when we know cognitively, I mean cognitively, they, I mean all the scientists are telling us about the ecological crisis, but this cognition doesn't move. So the question is whether somehow uh, can mobilize, I mean I would tell you, the poor, and I'm so going to use you, nuns. The religious sisters have been the core of the church, and they've been treated so badly. But if anybody, if anybody today is the avant-garde of this, that's it's a, that's the religious order. sisters, mm. which actually in Latin America until now, they were the ones that kept the church together, but now the, 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 the collapse in, in female vocations, when actually the male priest vocations are going up throughout Latin America everywhere, but the female just... The battle. So there are all kinds of problems within the church. I mean, no, I mean, they are propagators of universal norms. Mm -hmm. That's what the popes are today. Well, or of the gospel, I would say. Uh, moral universal norms is uh, that's part of it. Wow. But there's a spiritual humanistic task the pope can fulfill, and if he do it, like I think my secular friends are more convinced <coughs> Francis does that better than, let's say, Benedict XVI or others. Uh, then there, I think that your question doesn't make, uh, it does make sense, of course, but then you don't need to ask for whom he is talking or for, for whom he speaks. He speaks, he speaks as uh, when he does. He's talking to the world, yes. Yeah, he's talking yes. to, to the world, um, yes, to the church and to, to people all <laughs> out of the church. But when he talks, but power. yeah, I mean, we all have, in that sense, power, the power of speech. Hopefully, yes, in so this room, as, uh, to be honest, we have that, and um, then the legitimation is theologically spoken, one that he he is a follower, authentic follower of Christ. So, and that is a kind of offer to the, yeah, to the world. That, that is the I idea is, of mission. Not I more mean, and no less. He has and to walk the talk, as they say. He has to walk the talk. <laughs> well, if he doesn't walk the talk, then his talk will be empty. Yeah, and I will have to exercise my power now <laughs> as moderator yeah. Yeah. and invite you to, to continue the conversation outside at a reception. Unfortunately, our Zoom guests cannot participate in the reception. We're working on that on a digital form, so we'll say goodbye to our Zoom guests. And I'd like to thank um, Professor Casanova and our two wonderful respondents, uh, Riut Paz and uh, Christoph Polke. Thank you. So, I'd like to thank them for an incredibly inspiring and lively evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>